Father, we thank you for your grace to us this morning. We thank you that you give us this word in which you reveal yourself to us. Pray now that you would bless this reading and the hearing of it. Help me to preach faithfully. Anoint your people to hear. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading is in Psalm 22. Psalm 22, we'll be looking at the first six verses. Beginning in verse 1, this is the word of God. To the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, in you they trusted and were not. Put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. And this ends the reading of God's Word. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. Y'all sound great today. Thank you. So Voltaire, 1700s French writer, critic of the church, heavy duty critic of the church. There are seven deathbed sayings attributed to him. Uh, we don't know how many of them are actually actually happened, yeah, but they're at least attributed to them. To him, for one, a priest came to visit him on his deathbed and commanded him to renounce the devil, and to which Voltaire allegedly responded, where I'm going, I don't think I need to be making any new enemies uh, at, at this point in my life. But another one, he, uh, a candle at his bedside flared up. This is pre-electricity, of course. And as the candle flared up, he said, what? The flames already? Yeah. Uh, Two weeks ago, my best friend, lives in Alabama, was uh, on a business trip to Nashville. Called me that morning when he got there. Called me that afternoon to tell me some news. Said, well, the trip to Nashville did not go as planned. My daughter just sent me a round of pictures and a gigantic oak, oak tree after heavy rain had come up from the roots and crashed onto their kitchen. $30,000 worth of damage, some, something like that, we know now. Two days later, he, was, uh, he had an insurance adjuster coming over to look at the house. And the, I'm sorry, I'm giggling to myself, but this is bad. His... His wife moved her car to allow the insurance adjuster into the parking lot. And she parked on the top of a hill in front of their house. (laughs) She put the car in neutral. And then she goes chasing the car down the hill, (laughs) does not catch it, and it crashes into a neighbor's house. Well, my, my friend, for I'm not going to tell you his name. <laughs> he called me uh, Friday. Well, we talked on the phone Friday when we were actually driving here from Mississippi. and He had been, earlier in the week we had talked, and he had just ranted and raved and was threatening to move out of the country and just, just all, <laughs> all kinds of weird stuff like he always does. And uh, he called me Friday. He was in the best mood I've ever, probably ever heard of him. I've known him for 15 years. And uh, he said, you know, I know I've been griping. I know it's been terrible, but 
You know, I didn't tell you I've been on a keto diet for the past two weeks. And uh, I hadn't had any carbs. And I had pasta last night. And everything's okay now. (laughs) I'll probably call him this afternoon. We'll see if he's had any more carbs since then. But there is a hospice doctor named B.J. Thomas who has a TED Talk you can look up on YouTube. It's called What Really Matters at the End of Life. And he distinguishes, as a hospice doctor, between necessary suffering and unnecessary suffering. Necessary suffering is, well, in this case, the tree falls on your house, right? There's nothing you can do to avoid that. You get sick. You die. Uh, There are pain. People come in and out of your life. Now, all this is necessary. It's a part of the way this world works. It's a part of God's plan for us in this world. Well, B.J. Thomas says, so he gets these dying patients in his hospice, and he says, all right, these people are suffering. That's necessary. There's nothing I can do to stop it. They're going to die. But I can make them as comfortable as possible while they are here. That's the idea. Everything from the little anxieties that we face in life to the major catastrophes, job trouble, financial trouble, health trouble, family trouble, church trouble, which some of us know about. It adds up, right? The uh, roof's leaking, the rent's due, and it hurts. And somehow this is necessary. The unnecessary part is Well, that's what we're going to talk about. So why do we take these necessary elements of suffering in life? Why why do they crush us? Why are they so hard? Well, I'll submit a couple reasons. One is C.S. Lewis in the Screwtape Letters quoted a phrase, and he used it often, that when you turn something into a god that's not God, it will become a demon. It will become a devil. That is, you turn money and stuff into a god uh, instead of allowing it its proper place in your life when the tree falls through and the car goes crashing through yeah you're in trouble it's no longer just my car my car my house my house it's really we functionally we're saying my god my god why have you forsaken me that's the way it feels when we love our church so much that we, we would just put it above anything in the world it feels like when our church abandons us It's not just my church, my church. It's my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Mary, we marry a spouse. I've been married for 15 years. And watch my friend Wayne Herring and what he went through with his wife. And he tells me, you just cannot imagine. And I can't. I really can't. Because we get so close, we love these people so much, we almost exalt them to godlike status. And when they leave us, it's not my wife, my wife. It's my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? It's what? The flames already? This is hell uh, that we're suffering through. We need Jesus to come to us like he did to Martha. In Luke chapter 10, the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. I find myself doing that with my church members very often. They come to my office to lay everything on me, and I say, you are anxious and worried about many, many things. Look at the life of David, Psalm 22. We know it's written by David because the text actually tells us that it's written by David. We don't know his exact historical context when he wrote it. We know he went through a lot of trouble in his life. We know that he was on the run for a significant portion of his life from a powerful king who wanted to kill him. We know that the people of Israel at one point wanted to stone him to death. Uh, We know that he lost his best friend, Jonathan, and suffered greatly on account of it. We know that he committed a heinous sin against another one of his, his best friends, one of his inner circle, Uriah the Hittite. And we know that as a result, he lost a child we know that another one of his children, Absalom, you know, Absalom's name uh, never ceases to amuse me. Ab Shalom, father, my father is peace, and he's going to war. 
against his father who is peace. His own son betrays him. Whatever the cause in David's life as we get to Psalm 22, whatever it is, we are getting a glimpse of a point in David's life where he feels absolutely abandoned by God. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you don't answer. You ever feel like that? Why is heaven silent? By night I find no rest. Verse 6, I'm a worm. Very, where's your self-esteem, David? Right? We're changing the hymnals to take that out. Save a wretch like me. Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as that? We don't talk like this. This is where David is at this point in his life. The pains of his life had become like the pains of hell. That's how he felt anyway. What? The flames already? That hospice doctor that I mentioned, uh, B.J. Miller, I have something else to tell you about him this morning. When he was a sophomore in college, he and his friends thought it would be funny to climb on top of a commuter train. So he did, three of them I think it was. And uh, as he reached the top of the train, he stumbled, and he reached up to balance himself. Well, that was an electrical line above his head, of course. It sent a surge of electricity through his hand and out both of his feet. What, the flames already? And he had both legs and one of his arms amputated. He's lying in a hospital bed recovering and you know and he does recover he now has prosthetic legs he can walk and the like but you can see that they're prosthetic but as he's lying in the hospital bed recovering he hears nurses chattering in the hallway that it's snowing outside and as one of the nurses walks in he just said oh like David (laughs) King David you remember one particularly rough point in his life when the Philistines have taken over his hometown of Bethlehem David uh, says, oh, that I could drink water from the well that is in the corner in Bethlehem. You know, the little things we look to to bring us comfort in life in these times of necessary suffering. Uh, Well, B.J. Miller, oh, that I could just see the snow. And one of the nurses goes outside and makes a snowball for him and brings it in, and he holds it in his hand, and he stares at it, his one hand, that's left after the, after the accident. This is his quote. I cannot tell you the rapture I felt holding that snowball in my hand, the miracle of it all, the fascination as I watched it melt and turn into water. In that moment, just being a part of this planet in this universe mattered more to me than whether I lived or died. That little snowball packed all the inspiration I needed to try to live and to be okay if I didn't. Just a little snowball. That little snowball inspired him to go to med school and to become a physician, to help hundreds and hundreds of people who were facing suffering, not exactly like his, but but suffering nonetheless. And what he did with that experience of that snowball was he came up with unorthodox ways of alleviating the unnecessary suffering of patients. So, for instance, a patient with ALS who quit smoking years ago on her deathbed, she wants to take up smoking again. What's Dr. Miller's advice? Yeah, we'll let you smoke again. Because just to feel the smoke filling her lungs was the only thing at that point in her life that made her still feel like she was alive. It's necessary that she would die. It's necessary that she would suffer. But what can I do to alleviate the unnecessary suffering? Or like in his hospice, most of the people, if you've been in and out of hospices, uh, they don't have appetites. But he orders his kitchen staff to bake cookies every day just because the smell of it, the smell of, of... Fresh baked cookies to a dying patient. It's amazing. It's, you know, it's soup for the soul, if you, if you will. He says, I can't change that these people die, but I can change how they die. I can't control the necessary part of suffering, but I can help with the unnecessary part. 
Their suffering, in other words, doesn't mean they have to say what the flames, the flames already. But a snowball, <laughs> a cigarette, ba- fresh baked cookies. While all of these things may f- make you feel better, I had some barbecue in Memphis on the way here, in, uh, in Memphis on the way here from Mississippi, and it made me feel a lot better about all of my pains. <laughs> but surely there's something better. It's something I used to work with used to say. Surely we could do better. SWCDB. If there was ever an example of unnecessary suffering in this world, it is Jesus Christ on the road to the cross. He didn't have to die, did he? He's the only human being who ever lived who truly didn't deserve to die. He was without sin, but he was a man of sorrows. In Gethsemane, the great prayer as he, before he is betrayed, Father, remove this cup from me. And he's sweating great drops of blood and he's crying out and his friends have already started to abandon him essentially by falling asleep. They're going to abandon him and he's saying, let this cup pass. That's his first taste of what's coming. This is his what the flames already moment. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, has a famous quote on that passage where he said, that cup that Jesus was going to drink, there was the cup and hell was in it. He was going to drink it down for all his people and it began in that turn from Gethsemane. And on the cross, I know you see the connection, Jesus, Jesus' last words, he quotes Psalm 22, the words of King David. My God, my God. Now, if you know the life of Jesus if you know his sinless perfection, if you know his relationship with his father, whom he's calling God here, obviously, this is the the God who announced with an audible voice from the heavens, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased at his baptism, at his transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. He's greater than Moses and Elijah. When he said, my God, my God, what do you expect? You expect an answer from the father, which would be, yes, yes, my son. Anything you wish, your every request granted because Jesus was worthy of that. But instead, what, the flames already? Instead, it's my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's different takes on King David in Psalm 22 and why he wrote what he wrote. But I believe, personally at least, that David thought He was writing about himself. I think David actually felt this way. He felt abandoned and forsaken by God. Although in his better moments, he knew that God would never abandon abandon him. Psalm 27.10, David said, Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me in. In his better days, that's us too, on our better days, though everyone in the world abandon me, my father and my mother, The Lord will take me in. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He'll never abandon me. David knew this, but there are moments in our life when we say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it's as if on the cross, Jesus is saying, David, you thought, you only thought you were being abandoned by God. You only thought it. This is what being abandoned looks like. Look at my hands and my feet. Look at this crown of thorns on my head. Listen to my cries for mercy and listen to the silence of heaven as my beloved father does not respond to my pleas. David, this is hell. The Puritans used to say, this life, this life with all of its pains is the closest to hell a believer in Jesus Christ will ever get. This is the closest to hell you're ever going to get. Take comfort in that. My Second favorite short story. My favorite short story writer is a woman named Amy Hempel. And she's a brilliant writer. She has a story called In the Cemetery Where Al Jolson is Buried. Look it up sometime. It's wonderful. She laid out her deepest, darkest, haunting memory in that story. Autobiography, essentially. 
And the thing that she wrote about, the thing she said that haunted her most in all of her life was that her best friend died of cancer very young, and she was called upon to be the one to be there in the hospital with her, day in and day out. And she left. She abandoned her best friend on her deathbed because she couldn't watch, she couldn't take it. She couldn't take watching the suffering. But it's haunted her uh, for years since. And she describes that experience, that most painful experience, in the terms of a chimpanzee that she had already introduced in the story. It was a chimpanzee that had learned sign language in an experiment. All right. She says, this is what the pain felt like. I think of the chimp, the one with the talking hands. In the course of the experiment, that chimp had a baby. Imagine how her trainers must have thrilled when the mother without prompting, began to sign to her newborn. Baby, drink milk? Baby, play ball? And when the baby died, the mother stood over the body, her wrinkled hands moving with animal grace, forming again and again the words, Baby, come hug. Baby, come hug. Fluent now in the language of grief. You understand the gospel is that God comes for exactly that reason, to become fluent in the language of our grief. B.J. Thomas with a cigarette, the smell of cookies, a snowball, a melting snowball, what that did for him. You get the gospel. It melts your heart. And it will melt others' hearts whom you share it with because the gospel, in, in one sense, we, we've sung this morning about the man of sorrows. There's an old hymn that says, in every pang that rends the heart, the man of sorrows knew a part. Do you believe that he's come and shared in your sufferings and that now you share in his through him? Now, let's look at Jesus on the cross for just a minute before we finish and go to the table In both Matthew 27 and Mark 15, as Jesus is on the cross quoting Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you realize he's screaming there? He's screaming this psalm. I read it very calmly. We have a good microphone. Jesus was screaming these words. In fact, the Greek phrase that's used for how he recited these words and how he uttered his last groan is that he... Megas phone <laughs> He megaphoned it. He's screaming like a megaphone. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But I want you to listen to what he's screaming. I'm not going to scream. I want you to listen to what he's screaming. What is he saying? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, notice what he's not saying. All right? He's not saying my hands... My hands, why have you forsaken me? He's not saying my feet, my feet, my head, my head, my body, my body, why have you forsaken me? It's not that his body's just giving out on him. It's that God's giving up on him, at least in this moment. What that means for you, and this is your takeaway today, is that when you suffer, if you're a Christian, if you know Christ, I told my friend the other day, it's just my car, my car, my house, my house, my body, my body, my church, my church. It's never, never my God, my God. How do we know that? You think he died for nothing? Do you think he uttered those words for nothing? Whatever you go through, it may feel like the flames. It's not. It's not. Robert Murray McShane, the famous Scottish preacher, preached a Lord's Supper sermon on our passage. This is what he said. This is a little snippet of it. Dear friends, let us look into the ocean through which Christ waited for us. He was without any comforts of God on the cross, not a smile from his Father, not a kind look, not even a kind word. 
Nobody ever loved God and got this from God and yet loved him anyway. Nobody ever loved people and got this from people and yet continued to love them anyway. On the cross, he was in the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he stood before the judge and heard him say, Depart from me, ye cursed. This is the hell which Christ suffered, dear friends. The ocean of Christ's sufferings is unfathomable. From the broken bread and the poured out wine, do you not hear the cry arise? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And do you not hear the answer to the question? Listen to it as it passes around. Just listen. It's for you. For you. He was forsaken for you. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Even these may forget. Yet I will, not, I will not forget you. Behold, I've engraved you on the palm of my hands. And that's what we're seeing in the elements. So let me ask you this question as we close. Has God forsaken you? Has he ever forsaken you? Has he? I was thinking about starting a prayer list. And if you feel that you've truly been forsaken by God today... I would love to pray for you. I'll be at lunch. And I'd love to give God your name, if that's the case. But I have a feeling at the end of the day, I'll look down at that prayer list and I'll only see one name, rightfully abandoned and forsaken by God. Jesus. Because he bore our sins. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning that bearing shame and scoffing rude in our place condemned he stood, sealed our pardon with his blood. And we say, hallelujah, what a savior. I thank you for Westminster Chapel and all of these folks. We've already received hospitality from them. I pray for your blessing down upon them in return. I ask that you would continue to guide them and lead them in the direction that you would have them go. And even should that direction direction lead them through flames, that your presence would be there to cheer and to guide them. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.